Okay, let's talk about the pterygopalatine fossa and answer the questions. What are the boundaries of the pterygopalatine fossa and what are the nerves and arteries of the pterygopalatine fossa? Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Morton and I'm the noted anatomist. So to begin, let's talk about the boundaries. So the boundaries of this fossa, it's well, this fossa is a cone-shaped depression that's deep or medial to the infratemporal fossa. It's between the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone and the palatine bone and the maxilla. And the pterygopalatine fossa communicates with the nasal cavity and oral cavity, as well as the infratemporal fossa, the orbit, the pharynx, and middle cranial fossa via eight foramina or like eight openings. So let's do that again, except with pictures. On the right, there's a lateral view of the skull, and the blue line represents the level that we see in the superior view on the left. Now what we're going to do is take that level, and we're going to go down a little bit through the zygomatic arch, so that on the left, we see a superior view in a cross-section through the zygomatic arch, which is there. Then medial or deep to the zygomatic arch is the infratemporal fossa. Um, this space is a topic of another video, but on the medial wall of the infratemporal fossa is a door, and the outline of the door is called the pterygomaxillary fissure, and that is the entranceway medial to, uh, medial to that entranceway is the pterygopalatine fossa, and that cone-shaped fossa area is then have on its medial surface an opening in red called the sphenopalatine foramen, and if you go through the sphenopalatine frame and you enter the nasal cavity. So let's now take this pterygopalatine fossa and do something with it. Let's take a, a syringe that's filled with liquid plastic. We'll stick it through the pterygomaxillary fissure and inject this liquid plastic to fill the pterygopalatine fossa till it hardens and then crack the skull open and we're left with a plastic cast of the pterygopalatine fossa including its openings through the entrances and exits. And let's take that cast and blow it up. So there we have the pterygopalatine fossa with its openings. There is the foramen rotundum for V2. That communicates with the middle cranial fossa. There's the pharyngeal canal that communicates with the pharynx. Next, that's the pterygoid canal, also known as Vidian canal. We also have on the medial wall of the pterygopalatine fossa, the sphenopalatine foramen. That's what communicates with the nasal cavity. Laterally, we have the pterygomaxillary fissure, which communicates with the infratemporal fossa. On top, we have the infraorbital groove that communicates anteriorly with the floor of the orbit. Then below, we have the greater and lesser palatine canals and foramina that communicate with the palate and part of the oral cavity. So there we have all those openings associated with the pterygopalatine fossa. Uh, let's do a little osteology. If we look at a superior view, there's the frame and rotundum in two different views. So that's where V2, when it goes through the frame and rotundum, enters the pterygopalatine fossa. So if we look laterally on the skull and then tip the skull up, there is the pterygoid process or lateral plate of the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. And there is the maxilla. Between the two, it's appropriately called the pterygomaxillary fissure. That's the door that enters into the pterygopalatine fossa. And if we then go in a little bit more, we can see the pterygomaxillary fissure through the doorway. We enter the pterygopalatine fossa, and there is the sphenopalatine foramen that communicates into the nasal cavity. Now let's talk about the nerves. So the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve, or V2, will enter the pterygopalatine fossa via the foramen rotundum. That's the big contribution into the pterygopalatine fossa. But we also have the greater petrosal nerve, which is a branch of seven, the facial nerve, via the pterygoid canal that also enters. And then the nerve branches go all over the place. They go to the orbit, to the lacrimal gland, they go to the face, they go to the nasal cavity, the oral cavity, to the teeth and the palate, and to the pharynx. So there is the pterygopalatine fossa, and we overlay all the nerves. And there is V2, the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve that goes through the frame and rotundum to enter the pterygopalatine fossa. It's a little misleading how big it is. It actually looks more like that, the schematic, where you can see V1, V2, and V3 of the trigeminal nerve. And V1 goes through the superior orbital fissure. V2 goes through the frame and rotundum. V3 goes through the... Uh, 
um, foramen ovale, and V3 enters the infratemporal fossa, where V2 goes through the foramen rotundum and enters the pterygopalatine fossa there. And then you see V2 continues to the floor of the orbit, which is why that branch is called the infraorbital nerve, infra below the orbit. Now, let's do that again, where there's V2, which traverses the foramen rotundum, and the branch of V2 continues through the roof of the pterygopalatine fossa as the infraorbital nerve and then exits uh, below the eyeball, be below the orbit, I should say. Okay. Coming off the infraorbital nerve are a plexus of nerves called the superior alveolar nerves or superior alveolar plexus of nerves that provide sensation to the maxillary teeth on one side of the jaw. Now, there's three branches. We have an anterior superior alveolar nerve, a middle superior alveolar nerve, and a posterior superior alveolar nerve that often in uh, textbooks is abbreviated ASA, MSA, and PSA. So let's do that again. So here we've got the infraorbital nerve there that gives rise to the superior alveolar plexus of nerves with the anterior, middle, and posterior superior alveolar branches. All of those are general sensory from the upper maxillary teeth. Um, and so these are branches that are anesthetized by dentists whenever doing maxillary dental work. Next, we have the pharyngeal nerve. This is what is providing general sensation from V2 to part of the nasopharynx. Now, coming off of V2, we have these nerves that descend through the pterygopalatine fossa and then exit through the uh, greater and lesser palatine foramina. Those are the greater and lesser palatine nerves that we see here in this illustration that provide general sensation, pain, temperature, and touch to the um, hard palate and soft palate. And basically up the, the, the nasal palatine nerve will do more of the anterior part, but this will do sensation to the hard and soft palate and part of the palatine surface of the gums. Now this is one of those other nerves that contribute. There's seven, or the facial nerve, and it gives rise to this branch called the greater petrosal nerve because it's coursing uh, through the petrous part of the temporal bone, and it's a big one. So the greater petrosal nerve, though, meets up with a branch of sympathetics that are called the deep petrosal nerve. So sympathetics from the deep petrosal nerve meet up with parasympathetics in the greater petrosal nerve to become the nerve of the pterygoid canal or Vidian's nerve. Now, in the nerve of the pterygoid canal, we have parasympathetics and sympathetics. I'm gonna focus on parasympathetics for now. So the parasympathetics enter and synapse in this ganglion in the pterygopalatine fossa, appropriately called the pterygopalatine ganglion. And what's a ganglion? A collection of nerve cell bodies. What are the cell bodies? Those are the cell bodies of the postganglionic parasympathetic neurons. So the green circle on the left, that's the superior salivatory nucleus is what's shown by that green circle. But then the synapse with the postganglionic parasympathetic neurons happens in the pterygopalatine ganglion. Now, this is how cranial nerve 7 gets parasympathetics to parts of the face uh, in the head because these parasympathetics just hitchhike on branches of V2. So, for example, there's the infraorbital nerve and there's the zygomatic nerve. Now, the zygomatic branch of V2, it's going to do give rise to these zygomatic nerves. will do part of the sensation to the part of, lateral part of the face as outlined there on the right through the zygomatico-facial and zygomatico-temporal branches. But also what happens is parasympathetics hitchhike on the zygomatic nerve and go to the lacrimal gland. Let's show that again. So there's the nerve of the pterygoid canal synapsing with postganglionic parasympathetics in the pterygopalatine ganglion. And then you see those postganglionic parasympathetics jump on branches of V2 through a communicating branch to branches of V1 and then providing parasympathetic innervation to the lacrimal gland. And that's how cranial nerve seven gets to the lacrimal gland. All right.
Now we also have the nasal palatine nerve and you see that nerve traverses the sphenopalatine foramen and remember the sphenopalatine foramen is how we get into the nasal cavity. So that sphenopalatine nerve, here's a lateral view and shing, here's a medial view and notice that nasal palatine nerve has a septal and lateral branch that provides general sensation to the nasal cavity. All right. So now let's go back and finish the story of the deep petrosal nerve. Now, the deep petrosal nerve is transporting sympathetic fibers. And whenever we talk about sympathetic fibers, we got to go to the T1 to L2 spinal cord levels. And all sympathetics that go to the head all come from just the T1 spinal cord level. That pink circle is the cell body of a preganglionic sympathetic neuron in the lateral horn that then ascends up the sympathetic trunk to synapse in the superior cervical ganglion with a postganglionic sympathetic neuron. And those neuronal fibers wrap around the uh, carotids, and in this case, the internal carotid artery, and become the carotid plexus of nerves. Coming off this carotid plexus of sympathetics is a branch called the deep petrosal nerve. That deep petrosal nerve is transporting sympathetic fibers, and it meets up with the greater petrosal nerve transporting parasympathetic fibers, and they unite to form the nerve of the pterygoid canal, or Vidian's nerve, and they enter the pterygopalatine fossa. What happens is the sympathetics will not synapse in that pterygopalatine ganglion but the sympathetics course through that area and then follow the branches of V2 wherever V2 goes. And that's how you get sympathetics to the one way to get sympathetics to the orbit and to the palate and to uh, the and uh, nasal cavity and so forth. So here we have a, a view that you can see that straw that I've put in through the frame and rotundum. That straw represents V2. Now let's follow that straw laterally and you can see through the doorway of the pterygomaxillary fissure into the pterygopalatine fossa into the roof, there's V2 which then goes through the infraorbital fissure and then that enters the infraorbital groove and so now let's look at that same straw, but from the orbit view, there's the frame and rotundum where V2 enters the pterygopalatine fossa and then traverses the infraorbital fissure to enter the infraorbital groove. And now with X-ray vision, we see through the floor of the orbit, the infraorbital canal as V2 then exits the infraorbital foramen as the infraorbital nerve as we see here, and that infraorbital nerve provides general sensation to the lower eyelid, side of the nose, and upper lip. Now let's talk about the arteries of the pterygopalatine fossa. So the maxillary artery is the primary contribution, and it enters via the pterygomaxillary fissure laterally. And then its arterial branches supply the orbit, the face, the nasal and oral cavities, um, and the oral cavity, the teeth and the palate, as well as the pharynx. So here we have that pterygopalatine fossa, and there's the nerves. Now let's lay over the arteries. And there is the maxillary artery that traverses laterally through the pterygomaxillary fissure and then enters that fossa. So there's the external carotid artery that branches off the maxillary artery that goes through the infratemporal fossa and then enters the uh, pterygopalatine fossa, okay? There's the maxillary artery and is now inside the pterygopalatine fossa through the pterygomaxillary fissure. One of its branches right there gives rise to branches that go to the back of the uh, maxillary teeth. And we call it the posterior superior alveolar arteries. Then there. Then we also have the, uh, a, the terminal branch of the maxillary is the infraorbital arteries, or one of the terminal branches, I should say. And that infraorbital artery goes below the eye, but it also gives rise to the superior uh, to the middle and anterior superior alveolar arteries that supply part of the maxillary teeth. Um, the descending palatine artery then supplies the palate via the greater and lesser palatine branches that follow the nerves. And then we have the sphenopalatine artery that traverses the sphenopalatine foramen. And if we then see that sphenopalatine artery traverse through that foramen, and if we see on the medial view, uh, sends off branches to supply the nasal cavity, just like the nasopalatine nerve. So there's all the primary arteries of the pterygomaxillary fissure. And there my, or pterygopalatine fossa. And that, my friends, is the pterygopalatine fossa.
in a nutshell.